Hello, this is the Actual Model of Learner Orientation. Welcome and thank you for joining us. The title of our module is Learner Orientation and Success for Online Language Learning. My name is Adolfo Carrillo Cabello and I'm the Professional Development Specialist for the College of Liberal Arts at the Language Center at the University of Minnesota. I will now pass it on to my colleague Victoria Rosso who will introduce you to the contents of our presentation. Hi, I'm Victoria Russell, and I'm the chair of the Distance Learning Special Interest Group. I'm also an associate professor of Spanish and Foreign Language Education at Valdosta State University. And with us here today, we also have uh, Catherine Murphy-Judy. She is the vice chair of the Distance Learning Special Interest Group, and she's an associate professor of French at Virginia Commonwealth University. I'm going to give you this brief overview of what we're going to be covering today. And the first thing I need to share with you is that we're going to be using the term online language learners with the acronym OLL throughout all of these slides. So when you see OLL, that's referring to online language learners. Today, we're going to be covering the different types of orientation you can do with students, um, the communities and tools for help, technologies and different coaching and tutorials that are available for online language learners, and the importance of connectedness, the importance for students to connect with the teacher, with their peers, with the institution, the community, and the world at large. We're also going to show you some demonstrations of getting started modules, and we'll end with some next steps for you to learn further about how to orient your learners to your online language course. We are sharing this information with you based on research and also based on our collective years of experience teaching language online. Hi, this is Catherine. And in um, this section, this first segment of the module, we're going to take a look at learner success in three broad strokes. First of all, we're going to look at uh, an overview of learner success in general, in online learning in general. Next, we're going to move to investigate some factors that may work uh, for and against learner success, but specifically to learning languages online. And then we're going to have uh, some time to work together on online language learner profiles together as a group. So here are some things that we think we know about student success in online learning. First uh, is from the, the Chronicle of Higher Education a number of years ago. And, and this has been sort of um, ongoing knowledge, as it were, data about online, the success rates in online learning, that upwards of 50% of um, those learners who are learning online uh, do not succeed as opposed to 70 to 75 percent in face-to-face -face classes who have more success. Um, now I want to have give you a caveat here that it's really difficult to gather reliable comparable statistics on online success rates just because we have such a great variability in what's actually being gave, gathered as the statistics. And um, so with some of these statistics, just uh, keep in mind that maybe they're not as reliable as they could be. Um, in the second one, uh, this one is from the Community College Research Center, which does have very good statistics. And they've gathered data that shows that upwards of 20% more students at community colleges tend to withdraw from uh, online courses rather than face-to-face -face ones. Again, keep in mind this is overall online education, not specifically online language education. And the, the third piece that we have comes from another study that's from the Community College Research Center that was a study that was um, with some 40,000 students but they were all pretty much drawn from the state of Washington community colleges. And they seem to show that women, certain racial groups, 
And those students with higher GPA, as well as older students, tend to adapt better to online learning and overall are more successful. This is uh, one of the slides that uh, comes from a comparison, again, of community colleges in the post-secondary arena of southern and western states. And as you can see in the light blue in the southern states, you've got online success rates at 19%, and then, or, excuse me, those are failure withdrawal rates at 19%, and 32% for the online. Whereas in the Western states, you've got 10% of the face-to-face -face students who are withdrawing and failing, but 18%, almost double in the online realm. This is from a 2020, 2010 report from the community colleges. Now, with these statistics, as you're looking at this, you may say, be saying, why are we even going on from here? You know, what's this? Uh, obviously, online learning is not as good, and especially in languages. Well, the fact of the matter is, online learning is a brand new field. It's a growing field. Even while we've had lower enrollments um, across post-secondary education, online enrollments have continued to grow. And so this is an area of learning that is going to continue to grow. It's actually been growing faster than just face-to-face -face and, and all over um, enrollments. And so it's a new field, and it's a field that we're creating, and it's up to us to create a stronger, better field. That's why we're doing these modules through the Distance Learning SIG and ACTVL. Um, so, Let's do take a look at some of the factors that may negatively impact online learners' success, especially the language learners. The first group over on the left side, these are ones that are for just general online learning. And as it turns out, a lot of students, they think they can multitask and learn at the same time. And we already know that's not true, but they're doing that. Um, which leads into the next one, which is poor attention and focus while learning. Students need to pay attention and focus, not be off looking at other things online, not be talking to their friends, watching TV, but they tend to do that. Um, another activity that is not beneficial is when students are lurking rather than actively engaging in online learning behaviors. And the, the fourth part that's just general overall learning that has, may bring problems to the online learning arena is that we're missing some channels of communication. We're missing that immediacy. We're missing uh, certain senses like smell and you know, uh, sensory perceptions that can take away some channels of communication. We've got to keep that in mind. Now, looking more specifically to the online language learning area, some of the things that are negatively impacting success in online language learning are, first of all, that students have misconceptions about what online language learning is. Some students think it's just simply going to be easier because they don't have to show up in class or that they don't have to do speaking or they don't have to do listening. There are all kinds of misconceptions there. Um, a lot of students have language anxiety or certain kind of fear rather than involving themselves in the risk taking that we know from the research tells us you need to be an active and successful language learner. Students have frequently false beliefs about language learning in general. They think that if they do multiple choice questioning and answering, that somehow they're learning the language. And we know from communicative language learning that language learning is very involved, very active. And another thing, and I'm gonna go into this in more depth on the next uh, screen, is that our learners oft times in online language learning have several novice proficiencies. So let's take a look at those. Many basic or beginning online language learners are novices, not only in the target language, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, uh, Japanese, whichever language we're teaching them. They're novices at that. They're also novices in just generally, how do you learn a language? 
they very frequently are equally novices in online learning. And finally, they're, they don't have great proficiency in learner autonomy, whether it be online or offline or hybrid. So we've got four different novice factors that we as online language educators need to take into context. Another thing is that basic online language learners uh, can and should become increasingly proficient in all four of these tasks, the language that we're teaching them, how to learn a language, online learning in general, and becoming more autonomous learners. And finally, it's our duty as 21st century educators to guide our students towards learner autonomy and e-learning literacy. So, what do you think a good e-learner looks like? And I know some of the pictures are not exactly those of good learners, but right now, if you went ahead and um, stopped this recording, because it is a recording, you can stop it right here, uh, taking note of this uh, link that we have here, which is http colon slash slash bit dot lee slash learner orientation module. If you go to this, um, you will be able to put down some of the things that you think are, uh, it's a think pair share of what you think, you and your mentor, is a good online language learner. So why don't you just take uh, maybe two or three minutes, stop this video, and go and write down, jot down on this Google Doc some of your ideas. All righty, welcome back. So, you've had a chance, you and your mentor, to take a look at what a good e-learner may look like. And now we're going to take a look at what some um, folks who have been in different workshops and various professors who have been teaching and faculty who have been teaching online for a while have said that a good e-learner may look like. First of all, they're autonomous. They've got self-direction. Um, these are people who are collaborative and they're willing to collaborate with others, to buddy up with other learners online, with mentors, with um, someone who can help them in their language learning process. They're motivated, they're curious, and they, they're really eager to learn new things, especially in their new language. They're focused and task-oriented. Um, they're pretty independent, but they're willing, and this is so important, they're willing and they know that they have to ask for help before it's too late. Um, and finally, they're good time managers. Now, over on the other side, as we go down this list, these are more having to do with technology things that a good e-learner may need to have in their skill basket. They need to be computer literate, and they need to be ready and willing to learn some more computerized skills. They're able to use a email, and that they use their email, that they're competent with an internet browser, that they can use a variety of different online programs. We're gonna see in a minute some orientation programs and some tutorial programs that help them gain this kind of proficiency and these kind of knowledge uh, skills, knowledge and skills. They're also able to read and write online. So good typing skills is very helpful for an online learner. They should be comfortable with social media. A lot of times social media is, is a good um, background channel for them to be using with other learners, with their, their professors and with tutors and anyone who be, may be there to help them. And they're able to take what they're learning in this one venue in their online class and translate it or translate what they've learned about one app into another. And finally, that they're able to transfer in general their learning, whether it may be about technology, may be about the language, it may about, be about language learning, but they're able to transfer that to another venue. And of course, a lot of what looks like a good e-learner is what looks like a good 21st century learner. And just really quickly, the BOLD uh, Basic Online Language Design and Delivery Collaboratory has been running a survey for the, these past four years now, and we've learned some things about 
learner orientation. And in the next segment, Victoria is going to take us into some things about orientation. But I just wanted to show you really quickly some things that, that the, the bold um, survey has been able to discover about um, what's going on with learner orientation. Um, one of the things that we know is that um, the majority, as you can see, the long blue line of the, the, the universities and colleges and schools that have answered the survey have said that they require orientation um, and they have required orientation materials for their learners. And these tend to be asynchronous orientation materials. So well over 32% have that. We also have a number of um, places that require a face-to-face -face orientation. A different way of doing orientation is having a required synchronous, that is an online orientation. So all the learners have to be there at the same time. Um, second only to the required orientation materials is having orientation materials that are suggested but not required. And there are a number of places that have no orientation. And there were a couple of places that, who had some different means of orienting. But let's take a look with Victoria at some of the things that she and some of our colleagues have been doing with orientation and fostering good online learning habits. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so when a student enters your course, they need to know what to do when they first open the course up. They need to know what to look at first. It can be overwhelming, especially for novice online language learners. So the first thing you want to do is point them where to start. So you can see on the left-hand side in my table of contents, the very first tab, it says start here. And that takes them to what I call the getting started module. This is a screenshot from my Spanish 2001 course, which is an intermediate Spanish third semester university level Spanish. Unfortunately, all of my links are not appearing here because they cut off, but I'm going to explain to you all of the different things that I put into my getting started module for students. So they'll click on this first, and the very first link that says getting started, it tells them everything they need to do to get started in the course. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in a few minutes on the next slide. Um, they are they receive a welcome letter. You see that's the third link there that says welcome message. I send that out to them the Friday before classes start. So when classes start Monday, they're going to receive this welcome message and it tells them all about the mandatory orientation that they're going to have. It tells them all about the different uh, platforms and tools they're going to need. For example, they need a webcam. They're going to need a headset. There's certain, you know, technology requirements you're going to have. All of that information is in that welcome letter. The second thing I provided there was the professor, professor contact information. Your online students need to know how and when to reach you. So some professors, like I do, I tell them on uh, Saturday and Sunday, I may not be available because I cannot be available 24-7. Sometimes an online language student will expect their professors to be available 24-7. That's just not possible. So I tell them the best hours to reach me, how to reach me in my office, by telephone, by email, and virtually. So all of that information is there. I also give them, of course, the syllabus, the schedule of assignments and assessments. I make a document that shows what, what they're doing each week and what things are due and where they submit them. And in my course, as in all of the lower division courses at my university, we use three different platforms. That's not ideal. I'm hoping that our textbook will eventually integrate with our platform that we use for the university to deliver the course. We use um, D2L Brightspace. And um, at present, the textbook that we're using is not fully integrated with D2L, so they have to also use an iLearn website to submit assignments. And I also have my students um, using Talk Abroad. That is a platform where they speak with native speakers synchronously. And they are required to have four conversations uh, throughout my course, one conversation per chapter, 
that last 30 minutes. And these are guided conversations where I provide the questions to the conversation partners and to the students. And the beautiful thing about Talk Abroad is they schedule around the student's needs. So the student can schedule on the weekend, they can schedule early in the morning or late at night. They can hold their conversations at a time that's convenient for them. But in order to use these various platforms, students need to understand how they work. So I include links and information on tutorials on how to use these various platforms. And the nice thing about our program at my university, because all of the lower division Spanish courses are using the same technology and platforms such as iLearn and Talk Abroad, when a student learns how to use these in the first course in Spanish 1001, they have gained those skills they take with them into the next course in that articulated sequence. So that works out very well for us. Some of the things that you don't see here that were cut off on this screen graph, I also give the students information on netiquette, how to behave on discussion boards. For example, you don't type in all capital letters because some people might perceive that as screaming. I also provide students with a help discussion board. Um, so they have a place to go to 24 seven for help. If I'm not online, other students are encouraged to answer each other and help each other. And I very much praise students when they help their peers. Being an online language learner, a student can feel very lonely out there in cyberspace. So I try to create as many um, opportunities for the students to connect with each other and to connect with me as possible. I also um, ask students to introduce themselves to, the, to each other on the um, introduction discussion board. So they'll share about their hobbies. You can do some fun things, like you can ask them to do two truths and a lie. And so, for example, I might, my lie might be that I like cats when I actually hate cats. And you have to guess the lie about each other. So that kind of breaks the ice and helps the students to get to know each other. And then the last thing in my orientation, um, uh, my getting started module is the orientation link. I require my students to attend a um, mandatory online synchronous orientation. I provide a couple of opportunities for them to do so throughout the week. And um, I give students a couple of options during the day and an option in the evening. And when they write me and tell me, oh, I can't attend because I have too many things going on, I simply tell them that's fine. You can watch the recording at a later time, but you're going to have to write up a one-page single-space summary on what you learned um, from the, watching that recording of the orientation video. And it's surprising how many students are then able to make one of the orientation sessions that I offer. Um, so. I do get them coming and participating, and I can show them all the course technologies and screenshots and fully explain to them what is expected of them in the course and what they could expect of me as well. So moving to the next slide, um, when the students click on that very first link, it's, uh, it gives them a list of where to begin. And um, it, it's a list of seven things they need to do to get started in the course. And you'll see there um, that the students are given those orientation times where they, uh, they have to attend live. And if they cannot attend, I ask them to send me an email. And that's where I tell them, that's no problem. You don't have to attend, but you'll, you're going to have to write that uh, one page paper. So that's uh, just an example of what students see, those first seven steps to get off to a good start in the course. And then on the next slide, um, in the Getting Started module, I also have a sub-module on course information and technical help. And this is important for students to know what are the technical requirements of the course. We use that D2L platform, so there's a little system check where they can check on it, they can click on it, and it actually uh, tells the students, for example, they might need to update their um, quick time or what have you. So that is really important for students to make sure that their technologies are up to date and working on their computer. I also provide students with information on where to get the technical help they need from the institution. So for example, if they have difficulty with their password or with their email, that's going to be the IT help desk. But if they're having trouble with the actual D2L platform itself, that's gonna be a different 
area that they go to. So this technical help uh, sub-module gives them all of the places they can go to with, uh, through the institution to receive the technical help that they need. And so as I was saying earlier, uh, when I gave you the introduction of this module, how important it is for students to connect with you, the teacher, with each other, with the course content, and with the institution and beyond. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Adolfo Carrillo Cabello, who's going to tell you more about how students can connect more deeply with the institution. So far, we have introduced you to ideas on what you can integrate in your course and provided you with rationales as to why you might want to integrate some of the content to orient learners into your course. Um, Victoria presented you with information about what is specific information you want to integrate in terms of navigation. And Kathy talked to you about what are some of the technical difficulties that uh, your students may encounter as they progress through the course. My job is to tell you more about what are some of the ways in which you can disseminate some of the information and also how you can make your work easier by tapping into existing resources that you may have available at your institution and also in some uh, open uh, venues such as so social media. Uh, let's first start by categorizing these resources. And uh, one of the things that we hope we have made it clear is that there is a need to provide the students with information about how to navigate the course. And the second major category is information specific to the technologies that you have integrated into your course. Some of the information that you might want to provide is video tutorials or paper uh, uh, documentation uh, instructions of the technologies that you have adopted as part of your course. And always keeping in mind that you might want to uh, adopt uh, different forms so that you are in compliance with ADA requirements. Uh, in the next uh, few slides, I'll be telling you about three main sources of information that you can tap into uh, to uh, allow for this information to be disseminated in your course. And these are at, at your institution, um, information provided in the course management system or learning uh, management system, and also externally, for instance, in YouTube. Here at the University of Minnesota, for example, we have uh, a, a unit that is solely dedicated to provide support uh, for students who are enrolled in online courses. Uh, this unit uh, uh, is charged with monitoring the technologies that are integrated into the courses and for the sole reason of providing uh, technical support for students with these technologies. So that's one venue that you might want to uh, first uh, refer to when adopting technologies for your courses. What is it that is being currently supported at your institution may lead the way into what other technologies you might make available into your courses. Um, some publishers have also uh, led the way into providing students with additional forms of communication. So not only we can provide documentation uh, in written form, uh, in uh, instructional uh, sheets that we pass on to students in regards to um, getting started, uh, registering for the uh, uh, textbook uh, materials, the online platforms on the textbook, uh, but also uh, they have, uh, publishers have made this information available in the form of video tutorials. Uh, in my Spanish 2 course, for example, uh, we uh, were using uh, Wiley Plus Orion, and um, here's a screenshot of the course documentation that I provide to students. So um, embedding uh, those video tutorials that the publishers have already developed is a good way to provide the students with additional forms of information and communication so that they can 
uh, uh, effectively navigate and have access to the resources available to the course. Another way is tapping into uh, major uh, resource developers. Uh, one instance, for, uh, for example, is the use of Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, as you know, Blackboard is one of the main providers of software uh, for um, uh, distance and online learning. And they have extensive information uh, uh, in regards to uh, what are the different steps that the students will need to follow to first get started, but also, as Victoria mentioned, to keep up with the uh, technological developments, software updates, and also just basic setup of the uh, functionalities of their technologies. In the uh, screen, you can see, for instance, the documentation that is provided on how to set up uh, the ability to record activities online uh, in uh, the course management system using uh, Blackboard Collaborate and Wimba. Another form uh, of support that you might want to uh, integrate in your courses is licensed um, uh, tutorials that may, may be available at your institution. At the University of Minnesota, for example, we have uh, licensed subscriptions to lynda.com. And lynda.com is a uh, platform that integrates uh, video tutorials on many different tools, not just uh, language uh, uh, tools, but also other um, uh, software that uh, students may need to access uh, as part of their uh, integration or completion of other tasks. For example, if you are asking students to complete a uh, presentation in PowerPoint and make use of animations, lynda.com may uh, provide this information. And again, it's one less thing that you would need to develop yourself and that you can tap into and perhaps be more effective in that regard as to what information is presented. Uh, the information uh, collected in sites such as uh, lynda.com is very specific and is uh, uh, developed um, continuously. So for example, some of the tutorials available um, are uh, on newer forms uh, of uh, software or newer capabilities such as 3D animation. Another example of license, uh, license platform, platform service is Atomic Learning. And this information is available at Valdosta State and also the uh, University System of Georgia. And similar to lynda.com, it provides video tutorials with uh, practical applications such as uh, Microsoft Office software. Now, one uh, distinction here to make is that in, in the case of Atomic learn, Learner, Learning, instructors have the option uh, of compiling collections that then they can distribute to the particular course. On the right corner of the screen, for instance, you can see the custom training that is available just for Valdosta State students. Um, at the same time, some of the uh, information will be similar across the board. However, again, with ADA compliance, you, might, you want to make sure that the uh, tutorials that you choose uh, are in compliance with transcriptions, uh, so you have the need to make these available for some particular populations of students. Uh, in the case of the uh, use of lynda.com here at the University of Minnesota, similar to uh, the option available um, at Valdosta State with Atomic Learning, we have the option to provide customized training for our students. So this, since the learner course management system used at the University of Minnesota is Moodle, we can deploy a, a booklets that are uh, included as part of the course resources, but that are linked directly 
into Linda, Linda video tutorials. And um, one thing that you might also want to consider is that some of the um, uh, information that is available at these uh, uh, services already provides uh, uh, ideas as to what are the most frequently used uh, resources. So even though you might think of a specific needs for your students, it is a good idea to check into what other institutions are doing and also what other instructors at your institution are compiling. In the screen, uh, 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 in the current screen, for example, you can observe that some of the resources may not be directly linked to your uh, 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 features in your course, but that it's information that you might want to make available as well. So for instance, allowing students to check their courses in the university system is one way to keep them uh, up to date with information that is valuable for their learning. Next, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Victoria, who will talk about what you can do next. I'd like to thank all of you for watching this module today on learner orientation. And I encourage everyone who views this module to explore these topics further with their mentors. And you can find reflection questions, and those are available in the Dig Deeper area of the TED Ed lesson. I'd like to conclude by thanking ACTFL, the Distance Learning SIG, and our friends at the National Foreign Language Resource Center for all of the time and effort that they have put into creating these modules so that we can help our colleagues become really effective practitioners in the online language learning environment. Thanks to all of you from all of us. And on this last picture, this is not what we want any of us. We don't want the professors or the students to look like in an online language learning class. And hopefully this module will help all of us avoid the stress. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Bye. -bye.